So it is really my great pleasure to open up this series with our first speaker, Dr. Kaya Simon. Uh, Dr. Simon, PhD, teaches courses in the rhetorics of science, technology, and culture emphasis in the English department uh, on campus, where she also directs the Blue Goat Seminar first year writing program. Her current research focuses on Hmong women and literacy. Before becoming a professor, Dr. Simon taught secondary English at the middle and high school levels in Wisconsin. Basically, she's been in school her whole life. Well, welcome to the club. <laughs> so, Dr. Simon, you can take it away. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Chan, and for inviting me to be here. Um, it's great for to be the first speaker in the forum series. Uh, before I launch in and blather on forever, is my volume okay? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so my plan is to talk for about 20 minutes and leave some time at the end for questions. Um, that was what I was asked to do, and I generally try to do what I'm asked. So we'll, I should stick to that 20 minutes, which reminds me I'll start my stopwatch right now. Um, and this is part of an ongoing project, and so I really am looking forward to any feedback conversation that we're able to have about it. And if you are one of those folks who's watching this on the recording later after the, effect, after the fact, please do reach out to me, um, email or, or however, um, to keep the dialogue going. I'm, I'm definitely interested in having that conversation. So. Um, yeah, I think with that, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to hopefully toggle back and forth a little bit, not too often, but a little bit between screen sharing and um, uh, just the camera, because I do, uh, some of my stuff is text heavy, and so I want to give you the visual of, of the text and the language that I'm using, but also um, it's, you know, it's a big, bright white screen, so uh, moving back and forth will be good. Anyway, um, so the title today uh, of the talk refers to multilingual students, and I, I want to begin uh, with a with a nuanced definition or a nuanced conversation about what specific um, activity I'm talking about when I talk about the literate and rhetorical skills that multilingual students bring to our classrooms, and that is um, our multilingual students who have been language brokers. So, as defined by uh, Lucy C, uh, language brokers interpret and translate between culturally and linguistically different people and mediate interactions in a variety of situations. Um, and what's important to note about language brokers is that they are often um, sort of like informally recruited to serve in these roles. They have a relationship somehow with the person who's asking them to step in. Um, generally, they're not professionally trained official translators. And so uh, this, this idea about mediating is important, as you'll see as, throughout the talk. Um, language brokers are not necessarily neutral. Um, agents, right? They're working as a member of a team in mediating these situations. Um, yeah, I, I think the other, as a technical note, um, I'll be using probably, I'll be moving between the word interpret and translate, but just as a technical note, um, interpret, it refers to oral language, to oral speech, and translate is talking about written language. Um, but for the for the sake of, of the talk today, I'll probably be toggling between those two. Um, so what I'm specifically speaking about even more even more than language brokers are child language brokers, um, which Marjorie Fulsich Oriana has argued is a ubiquitous experience, nearly ubiquitous experience for migrant children in the United States. Um, it's a complicated, significant, informative experience, really, for the children of immigrants. And um, our many of our students, or some of our students, I should say, I don't want any of us to assume that our multilingual students did grow up doing this service for their families. Um, but it's it's possible that if they are a second generation immigrant, if they came over as a, as a child or if they were born after their parents migrated, there's a chance that this is something that they did. So child language brokers interpret and translate for their families um, and community members. And it's common among immigrant families because, um, because uh, the reality of America might be multilingual, but the institutional dominance, right, is monolingual English. And so if families immigrate to the United States with less fluency in English, um, and based on what we know about children acquiring language and the fact that children are enrolled in school, they can acquire English faster than their parents and elders. And so um, they get called to serve as child language brokers. Um, in general, uh, there's like an inter interdisciplinary body of research about child language brokering that, that uh, has studied it as it's happening. And I'm gonna give you a quick gloss of that, again, just for the interest of time. Um, so this is, as I said, Marjorie Falsich Oriana argues it's nearly ubiquitous. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting experience as the child language brokers report on it. Um, on one hand, right, they see it as no big deal. Like this is just a thing that they do, it's a thing that they're capable of doing. 
Um, and for the most part, it's almost like a, a, an annoyance, right? A stressful situation, a burden. Um, it's not necessarily something they feel like it's an advanced skill that 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 they're being asked to do. It's it's more so for the most part, I think, kind of a pain while it's happening. Um, but it, the researchers who dig in deeper to it, right, I can also get child language brokers to to admit, right, that in addition to it being stressful, in addition to it being sort of a pain, um, they also like feel good about being able to help their families, and they they understand that this is something that's really important to the success of their family in America, and so um, they they know that that's there. Um, and so child language brokering, it's like a it's like a mixed bag, right? Which is why um, I describe it here as complicated, significant, informative, right? It's 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 good and bad. It's stressful and not. It's necessary and it's also um, uh, you know frustrating that it has to be necessary, but such is the state. Um, so my project uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today um, didn't actually begin talking about or didn't begin seeking to investigate language child language brokering, but it that. Uh, approach kind of came to me. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I'm not necessarily talking about child language brokering as it's happening. Um, this project is about what lasting literate and rhetorical skills do child language brokers develop that they can then draw from throughout the rest of their lives. Um, and when I say that this this came to me, um, it came to me through the context of this ethnographic study of Hmong women's literacy that I've been working on. Uh, the first iteration of it began with my dissertation research, and then I've been doing some follow-up research since then. Um, I do want to begin before I say anything else that I'm mindful of the privilege I have as a white academic researcher in studying a community that's not my own, um, and I've done what I can to decolonize the process and to be reflexive and, and use feminist methods to position the women who are willing to work with me as research partners. Um, I do try to do research that will contribute to the community, not extract from it, and um, amplify the voices of the women who share their stories with me. Um, and through, throughout the whole process, I love my research. I love being able to have this gift, and I'm humble in the gift of the, of the time and the energy and the stories that I have received as a process of the work. Um, I've worked with and interviewed 28 Hmong women from three locations in the upper Midwest, and I do what, what's called a literacy history interview. Um, a literacy history interview is a semi-structured, and I'll say structured is really semi, <laughs> really semi-structured, um, where I ask uh, participants to talk to me about their memories, about learning to read and write, about their educational experiences, about any significant memories they have about literacy practices, all that kind of stuff. And it's really great because participants are able to control the stories they tell, they're able to determine the representations, they're able to talk to me about um, what, what's important to them about reading and writing. So the current version of this study grows from my dissertation, but it's different from it. My dissertation was about family literacy practices within Hmong families. Um, and uh, I don't mean to assume uh, full knowledge among this audience about uh, the Hmong community, but I know I can assume a little bit more than when I speak to audiences in different places who don't have a Hmong community local. Um, so uh, basically, you know, with the with the first generation of Hmong refugees um, being relocated to the U.S. as a result of their participation in the Secret War, uh, late 70s through 2005, right? Um, the the story that gets told, right, is about the Hmong reliance on oral culture, and there's a um, I think work to be done to dismantle assumptions about what that means in terms of literacy. And so my dissertation really spoke to the fact that um, mainstream institutions might assume that Hmong families didn't care about literacy, but the reality was very, very vastly different than that. Um, and so that was that was part of that work. The other reason why this is about Hmong women specifically is because um, because of that of the literacy history in Laos, um, gender. Uh, expectations and cultural expectations, right? The daughters of the first generation of refugees um, are the first really to have access to literacy. And so this generation is incredibly significant, I think, to study for, for a variety of reasons. Um, the stories they have to tell are very powerful. Um, yeah, I think that's all I, I want to say about the context of the study at this point. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I said I didn't intend to study language brokering, and the reason that I'm there is because of what I think some of the some of the researchers who studied language brokering have said, which is that language brokers tend to think that um, it's no big deal, but 
it infuses everything. And so I've got this block quote from a research participant, uh, and I should say here, all names in this, that I'll refer to are pseudonyms um, of the women who shared these stories. So Sia told me, um, we were talking about early language acquisition, um, said, actually I spoke Hmong all the way up until going to grade school. And then once school started, it was really intense being forced to learn English right away. I knew that English is needed and my parents were really stressing the need for all of us, that she meant her brothers and sisters, uh, to learn English because we were basically going to be the interpreters for my parents. And Sia moved to the U.S. when she was three, um, and so this is one of her kind of earliest memories of connecting um, language learning with language brokering. And again, it, it just, like, I didn't ask for this, right? It just, it came up, and, and these stories continued coming up. So um, with revisiting the data now um, with new eyes, right, I've, I've begun to ask more questions about what it means um, for, for child language brokers to have lived through that and to have have done it as a as a matter of course, um, what does that mean then for the for their adult literacy experiences? Um, and in preliminary findings, right, in preliminary analysis of the data through this lens um, that I was able to do through all those inter interview transcripts and through um, the uh, text that they shared with me, um, I've got this idea. Um, that I'm arguing that child language brokers learn literate and rhetorical skills in three realms. And I'm focusing specifically on the literate and rhetorical skills. Um, they learn lots of skills, right? But thinking specifically about literate and rhetorical skills. Um, the first is that uh, child language brokers become conversant with institutions when they're younger than most of us have to, right? And what I mean by that is uh, thinking about like the, the, the language of bureaucracy and the primate, the, the, the way forms and completing them correctly, open access and shut down access, and deadlines and meetings and all of that stuff. Um, this is a this is a, a both a, a literacy lesson that child language brokers um, learn very young. Uh, the second one is about language literacy and authority, um, and the relationship between um, in monolingual U.S. Right, the the knowledge of how English um, and who has it and who doesn't, who can read and write in it, um, how that gives certain folks authority and rescinds authority from others, and, and it's really about the movement of power. So child language brokers become aware of the connections between language and literacy and authority as, at a very young age. Um, and then the third is this idea of heightened audience awareness, which is actually um, where I'm going to focus today. I, I could talk about this all day, as I know every researcher says who cares about their research, but um, I, with only having about 20 minutes, I do, I do just want to focus here um, on heightened audience awareness. So I'm actually going to um, pause real quick here and take a little sip of water. <laughs> and just say um, that Part of the process of child language brokering, right, is having um, two audiences right in front of you, right at the at the moment that you're trying to communicate, right, as you're translating between them. Um, I'm actually going to stop sharing the screen here just for a minute. Um, so what you've got as a, as uh, in the situation, right, is not just a, two different like members of an audience that you're trying to bridge cultural and linguistic gaps between. Um, but at times they're also in conflict, as many of the stories of child language brokering. Um, come out, right, because child language brokers are called to serve in situations um, at, at stores, right, mediating transactions. They're called to the phone a lot. Um, they have to do medical appointments sometimes, social welfare offices, right, like child language brokers are in the realms of adults regularly, um, and not always for good reasons. And so they're also dealing with um, like that, that dynamic as they're also trying to bridge these um, cultural gaps. And as um, I mentioned earlier, right, they're, they're mediating, right? They're, they're doing the work um, out of loyalty to their family. And so as they're also like dealing with these competing audiences, and sometimes friendly, I mean, it's not always competing, right? But as they're dealing with these two audiences, they're um, uh, working all the time, right? To think about presenting their parents in the best light and, and, and making sure that that is, um, and that they're being accurate and all that. So I'll get a little bit deeper into um, some data and share a couple more quotes from participants, which is the best part about this research anyway. Um, oh wait, I forgot to click the share screen, sorry. Uh, so close, uh, here we go. Okay, yeah, good, heightened audience awareness. So um, neatly, again, I've divided this up into kind of three specifics. So uh, one uh, aspect of heightened audience awareness that I think has some purchase in, in college classrooms later on in life is that child language workers become very aware of the emotional effects of the text they translate. And so um, from a rhetorical perspective, right, they, they can think about, like, they can anticipate, they learn, they think about, like, I have to 
communicate the meaning of this text, but I also know in advance that it's not going to be well received, right? Or it's going to be received in a certain way. Um, and again, um, the examples that came up most often that related to this lesson were about bills. So often the, the women who shared their stories with me were translating bills that came in the mail and helping their parents pay them and write the checks and all that kind of stuff. So um, this is Yur, another participant, and, and she remembers that the utility bill would come and then I knew this is water and water costs this much and I would translate that to my parents and I would deal with my parents yelling at everybody for using so much water. And so this is another, like, I, I guess, yeah, just a, a, a immediate um, reminder, right, that, that things, that messages have consequences, right, and that they do create emotional reactions. And uh, your and others spoke about the, the way that they would steal themselves for when bills, when bills came, right, they would steal themselves for those emotional effects. They would um, also, like, try to translate in a way that was as, um, neutral as possible, right, um, and hopefully not bear too much wrath from their siblings for being the bearer of bad news to their parents, right? It's a really, it's a really complicated um, situation. Um, and not that, that the experience directly translates to college, right, but, but we're always asking students, I think, to be aware of, of the, um, not just what they're saying, but who they're saying it to, right, or what they're writing or who they're writing it to, what is the intended audience. And that anticipation of those effects is a pretty a, a adult, empathetic skill, right, that child language brokers are experiencing from a very young age. Um, so then the second, the second relationship with audience awareness is about feeling responsible to be as accurate as possible um, because they want to, like I said, you know, they, they want to be of service and of help, right? And so there are situations in these adult, situ in these adult realms where they don't understand the vocabulary, the concepts, um, especially like related to finances, social welfare agencies, courts, schools, and medicine. So um, Alex, a participant, uh, was helping, her parents wanted to take out a life insurance policy, and so they brought paperwork for that home and asked her to work through it with them. Um, and she remembers this being like in middle school, right? So. She, I read the policy and I didn't understand anything. Even when it came to electricity bills or like house mortgage or escrow, I didn't understand any of that. So that's where it starts, right? Like, of course, a middle schooler doesn't understand life insurance or escrow, right? Which is the thing I still personally don't really understand, right? But um, it's uh, the second part of this is the is where the um, the literacy and rhetorical skills come in, right? Because because they felt responsible to be as accurate as possible, um, they figured out ways to answer these questions, right? So uh, Paku remembers like kind of a similar situation and, and I, w I was overwhelmed with the language and she was talking about bills and trying to look it up in the dictionary. What does this mean? And, you know, trying to make sense of it, that was challenging. So the point here is that um, these child language brokers are aware of a gap in their knowledge and they find resources to fill it. Um, so this story is about using reference text, and this is like before the internet, right? So, so she's literally using a dictionary. Today might be different, but also um, participants spoke about um, asking teachers, right, for help, or actually asking the, the person in the agency to re-explain something so that they could try to re-explain it to their parents. Um, they're in real time, right, aware of a gap in their knowledge, but then figuring out a way to solve it, which again is like another one of these classroom situations and, and higher ed situations, right, that, that we can, that we can um, really, really understand that child language brokers have been doing this work since for a very long time. Um, I do also, you know, like there was, it came up in uh, medical, in stories about medical appointments too, where like as a young person, like I don't know what cholesterol is and like trying to, trying to translate that, that kind of question. Um, and one participant, uh, you know, said she just always did the best she could. And, you know, um, there were inst instances too where she would explain the way around it. And then her mom would say like, oh, you mean blah, and say the word among immediately. And her be like, oh yeah, okay, good. Um, and she ended that whole story by by saying like, and my parents are both still alive, so I guess it worked out, <laughs> which um, was a lighthearted way. But really, you know, um, not to make too light of the of the stress, right, in the moment, right, of not feeling confident about a accurate translation, but to also kind of give um, respect and honor to the to the ways that the child language brokers work out, so they can do better next time. Um, so the third thing about audience awareness that I wanted to cover today is about um, child language brokers understanding that their parent is at a power deficit in relation to the institution and the English language. And um, that the way this comes out in terms of audience awareness 
is the choices that the child language broker makes to kind of mediate that power differential, right? Um, as a, so this is Gloria Valdez in her book, Expanding Definitions of Giftedness, which is about um, child language brokers as well. Uh, Valdez identifies that the child language broker is a member of a team whose goal is to present the impression of the parent that will be the most effective in a given context. And the women who shared their stories with me spoke about, about ways that they um, wanted, they used their audience awareness to, to translate to, to um, yeah, to try to address some of these power differentials um, that affected the way they, they chose to translate or interpret situations. So um, there wasn't an easy way to get a block quote for this. I'm actually just going to tell you the story of me who was translating for her own parent-teacher conferences. Um, and the parent, the, the uh, teacher was t telling uh, the parent, her, her dad, about a standardized test score, the, like for the state writing test or whatever. And me had earned a 4.5 out of 5. And the teacher was saying that that's really good. And it's for the state standardized test. And the, her dad said, is that an A? Asked the teacher, you know, is that an A? And me translated that. And the teacher said, well, we don't really do grades for standardized tests um, because it's a standardized test and blah, blah, blah. And um, her dad's response was like, well, then this doesn't matter. Why are you telling me about this? And me, in that moment, didn't chose not to translate her father's response to the teacher. And this is one of those stories where she was, we were actually talking about something else. It wasn't about language brokering. But in the, in the story, it came out that she was, um, she knew, right, that the teacher might already think her dad was not a, a supportive of education because of his because he was Hmong and he was um, not able to speak English and it was pretty rare for him to uh, for Hmong parents to be at conferences at all right um, and while me knew her dad cared about education so much like there was A's or nothing for her right so all all he wanted was for her to succeed in education she also knew that if he told if she translated that her dad didn't care about the standardized test that the teacher might think less of her dad right so she um, so she made that choice in that moment, right? Because she also wanted to protect um, her dad from the teacher's impression. So this is audience awareness, like in real time and in really complicated linguistic and, and translation decisions. Um, and again, like from a very young age, I just remain in awe of what child language brokers practice and learn and do, um, which explains, right, some of that stress that they might feel. Um, and that, like I said earlier, about that mixed bag about what it means um, to be a child language broker. So that's a real quick gloss of the findings. Um, a few a few participants voices. I'm at I'm at 20 minutes. And so I do. But I did promise I was going to close with um, some ideas about classroom uptake, which I, I tried to weave in a little bit throughout. But I would just want to say a little bit more. Um, I, I want to repeat again, I do not mean to imply that every Hmong student we have grew up child, as a child language broker. Every multilingual student at UW Claire did not grow up, you know, doing this work. I want to make that very clear. We cannot assume our students' experiences, right? Um, but it's, I think we can assume that some of them have, have done it, right? And we might, might not be able to uh, identify them. And so rather than um, speaking directly to individual students about these things immediately, um, I think that when my approach is to talking or to working these things in is to use um, ideas about translation and to use ideas about uh, moving across languages in different groups. Um, in a general sense, right, and offering, say, like hypothetical examples and, and, and doing, like, stating that those things exist is beneficial both to our multilingual students and to our monolingual students because these, um, having these skills is good for everybody, right? Um, our multilingual students might be able to draw from already practiced skills in a way that our monolingual students will have to learn. But the point is, um, we can apply translation situations to uh, different different ideas to get students to think in these terms. Uh, for one example, I do have, because uh, I teach the Blue Gold Seminar intro first year writing class, um, I do have an assignment that I give to all students where they have to translate their research for someone who cares about their education but who isn't in college, right? Um, and, and in that act, right, they have to think about the needs of the audience, they have to think about what words everyone understands, they have to think about all of that stuff, and it is a good reminder for multilingual students of skills they might have, um, but it's also just a way to, to admit, right, academic realms are linguistically and culturally different than other places, and we're all kind of moving between 
um, those languages and skills as we go. Um, I do think that if we do know students who are multilingual, who um, are, if we're able to remind them of these skills that they have, as we're not just as we're teaching them, right, but also as we're advising them, as we're helping them apply for stuff, as we're helping them like work through the the channels, the bureaucracy of higher education, um, that's another good thing to say. Like this is a different situation, but you you have done things like this before, and how can you transfer those skills from one from one uh, realm to this realm? Um, ultimately, though, right, like understanding more about. Uh, uh, translating and interpreting and the work of it is is rhetorical and literate as much as it is linguistic um, and i know that the, all of those things map over each other right but the the skills that one learns when one's translating um, are are incredibly advanced and and bring in all the different um, aspects right of, of all of that different work and as you are assigning writing in your classrooms or as you are helping like i said helping students with um, like rhetorical situations of any kind, um, it's it's good to remember and, and remind. And now that you understand a little bit more about uh, what that what this what those potentials for skills are, right? Um, we can do whatever we can to help students leverage them and make the most of them in this in this place. So, I did go a little bit over. I I apologize for that, but I am looking forward to the conversation. So thanks. Thank you so much. Um. I guess this is time for the audience to ask questions. Uh, I think chances are we can just, um, given that it is not a very large group, maybe, you know, for those who want to ask questions, they can speak up. Oh, great. And if uh, Brian can unmute everybody. Or you can unmute yourself as well. There is a uh, kind of an icon for microphone towards the top. Uh, if you click on that, it should unmute, I think. Then we're working on the audio. <laughs> or, you know, obviously we can, um, there's a question on the chat box, so if you don't mind, I can maybe ask that on behalf of uh, Rosemary. The question is, what makes a child language broker different from a typical translator? Great question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, well, two things. Um, well, maybe they're the same thing. So a typical translator or a professionally trained translator is professionally trained, right? Um, and so they... Uh, work through the different considerations, right? And and part of that definitely, I think the biggest difference is that they're a neutral party in theory, right? That they are um, representing both communicators as neutrally as possible to try to, like they're not playing that kind of mediating or bridging role. Um, and so child language brokers, first of all, don't necessarily have, like the qualification for being a child language broker is that your parents make you do it, right? Um, and and uh, probably you know more English than they do, but you might also not know as much of the home language as you need to too, right? So it's complicated, right? So professional translators in theory have more fluency in, in the languages they're working in. But I, I do think that that um, neutral, the neutral component of it is, uh, is an important thing, an important difference. And it's also an interesting thing that comes up um, in the interviews I've done where even even now, like so today at a hospital, right, there, there's more availability of translators. It's not perfect. It takes too long. You have to request it and then wait 20 minutes and, you know, whatever. Um, but many families still would rather have a family member present because they they trust the advocacy of the family member more so than the neutral translator. So um, I think that, that that probably actually speaks to the difference more than earlier stuff I said. Yeah, great. So we have another question that comes through the chat box. Uh, it's from Mayer. What usually happens when the child broker leaves the family for college? What are some of the challenges the family faces when that child broker leaves? Yeah, Mayer, thanks so much um, for that. Uh, several things happen. <laughs> um, often the, the, ch the person who goes away to college is called upon to continue to to do the translating work, especially if um, there's a gap in age right between the college, the person who's gone to college and younger brothers and sisters who maybe are less 
good at that. So um, I've heard I heard stories about um, folks who who kept going home periodically and doing some of that work, um, and like even attending medical appointments, right? Like working those around class schedules. Um, that's one version I heard of the of the way the family navigates that change. The other is I've heard um, uh, the the college age pr child is like talking the middle school age or high school age child on the phone through a translation. So the <laughs> um, especially when it comes to like bills and paperwork, right? When you have enough time that you can kind of work through those things. Um, yeah, it's tough, and it, it's it's one of those things that the women. So the women who shared their stories with me were. Um, like I said, like Generation 1.5 or early second gen, um, and and additionally culturally, right? It wasn't always um, uh, accepted for them to move into dorms, right? So they did often they were staying at home and going to college and, and continuing to serve in that same role, which is another one of those added burdens, um, and particularly for these women, right? Of like being a good woman daughter, there's the the continual um, expectation, right, of contributing to the family. And also trying to maintain straight A's and all of that, all of that work is is tough. So um, some families, I, I do think, like the younger siblings, kind of stepped up and and took over for the college age student. But that's de there was always the the women who spoke about it. There was a transition period, you know, where it's like the olders were training the youngers. Thank you for that question. Yeah, great. Yeah, um, I actually have another question. Great. Um, so how do we like better support these students who were these like child workers that are not in college and like you said they still like try to navigate between their schedule to still help out their parents? Yeah, yeah, that's a do you mean like from a from a professor standpoint, like how can we what can we do about that? Yes. That is an excellent question. <laughs> um and you know, I feel like I don't I don't know I don't feel how can I say? Um I don't feel like it's my right to to tell people how to manage their time, right? But I do think as professors, it's our um, it's it's on us to understand the different circumstances our students are operating in, and and to understand and validate, and just be aware that the that the expectations that we place on them are in addition to all of the other expectations that are operating on them. And so one of the one of the reasons actually why I was I'm so excited to share even through this faculty forum is to increase awareness of like all of the different responsibilities our students are juggling and it's in addition to a part time job and in addition to 18 credits they are also you know learning about compound interest so they can help their folks with a car loan you know um, so I, I I think that that's my first step and then. In, in addition to, you know, like the way, hopefully, right, once we understand more, we are more compassionate about deadlines and we uh, can work with students' workload and we can talk them through. And again, like if I knew this about a student, I would I would try to remind them of like this. I know that it's so much work and it's such a pain for you to have to do this, but look at these cool things you're also learning and they're going to help you <laughs> like like to. Um, and then, I mean, it's not just cool, right? It's really advanced. It's really advanced linguistic work and really advanced um, rhetorical awareness that can only help right, in other situations in their lives. Yeah, great questions. Any more from the audience? I mean, as an instructor, as a faculty, and as I guess a program director uh, of programming that supports students. I think perhaps we are in a position to remind students, you know, that these students, the strengths, the skills that they, they bring forth to this community. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't know if every everybody who is under, you know, this circumstance, like Kyle was talking about, you know, these child language brokers, whether they're aware, in fact, of the talents, the, the, the strengths that they actually bring forth. Um, maybe because they were called upon to do this so early in life, it was somewhat of a given that is, as you kind of described, it's somewhat of an annoyance, but it's a given in life and therefore perhaps, just perhaps, they're not always aware of, you know, the re resiliency that they have within them. I mean, life is challenging very often for, for many people, certainly including them. But if they, we can remind them to draw upon that strength uh, with the flexibility that we can provide uh, when it's possible and appropriate, 
perhaps you know th things can be a little bit easier, a little bit better for them, at least in the long run, because they know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. They've gone through so much already. They've done so much so early already. Perhaps you know the current challenges. It's not doesn't look as insurmountable in the grand scheme of things. Right. Right. Yeah. Anything else from um, anybody who's here? I think the, the only other thing I would add is that it's so, um, you know, it, often being bilingual or multilingual is treated as a deficit when it comes to writing and reading. Um, and the other the other thing I want everyone to take from this is that it, it's actually not, right? Like, like whether or not the article is placed in the exact right position in the sentence is like less important than these advanced skills, right? And so I think that's the other um, thing to remind both students who are experiencing this, but also all of all of us who might think of being bilingual as a deficit or as a problem to be overcome. It's actually this incredible gift that mon students who identify as monolingual can't necessarily imagine in the same way. That's, that's the last plug I'd throw in for that. <laughs> yeah, definitely so. Um, I would say even for folks who are not asked to be child um, mediators, even if you just live in that environment, is actually, I think personally, a much more enriching environment. So I would encourage everybody to seek out those opportunities, even if you don't necessarily grow up or live in that type of household situation. So I want to be mindful of time. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you so much, Kaya, for uh, being our first speaker uh, for a great talk. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye.